Hello, welcome back. We are now on to the pancreas. Um, the pancreas is a mixed organ in that it is both endocrine and exocrine. Endocrine that it releases a couple hormones, exocrine that it releases digestive enzymes and um, alkaline buffer. We're gonna talk more about the digestive functions in the digestive system. We're just gonna focus on the endocrine system here. And what's interesting about the um, division of that workload is only about 1% or less of the pancreas is endocrine and 99 plus percent is digestive. So we're really only talking about a tiny little fraction of pancreatic function is endocrine, but it's so important um, for healthy living um, for the pancreas. And when you don't have functional pancreatic islets, you end up with diabetes, which I also wanted to talk about in this uh, video. So let's take a look. Um, anatomically of our pancreas. So the pancreas sits underneath the stomach. So we don't see it here, but the stomach is this, you know, is going to come up and sit right on top of the pancreas. So the stomach churns and breaks down our food. We chew, 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 we swallow. It's, you know, sits in the stomach for a few hours. And then our food comes into the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine, this kind of big C-shaped tube that the pancreas kind of cuddles right up next to. Now this position is very important because in the stomach, it is pH two. Most of these, those, those digestive enzymes and the hormones and everything that need to work properly for digestion work best at a neutral or slightly alkaline pH. So we need this to go up to pH eight. And so that's one of those digestive functions, that buffer that needs to be secreted from the pancreas, secretes into the duodenum to neutralize this, this acidic, um, churned up food stuff from a pH 2 into a pH 8, so then the rest of digestion can continue. Can continue. But again, we're going to focus primarily on the endocrine function. So if you were to take a slice of the pancreas, like I said, like 99% of it is digestive, you're, you'd find little islands, and that's actually what their name implies, pancreatic islets. Islet is a little island of endocrine tissue. So we have tiny little pockets of endocrine tissue, just like scattered all over the pancreas. These used to be called islets of Langerhans. So you might have seen that term, but again, we're getting rid of the name names and we call it a pancreatic islet. Um, and in the pa pancreatic islet, we have um, different kinds of cells, different groups of cells. We have alpha cells and we have beta cells. It really doesn't show up very well. So alpha cells and beta cells. So alpha cells produce a hormone called glucagon and beta cells produce insulin, which we are a little bit more familiar with, um, with association with the pancreas. We can't really tell the difference in a microscope slide. Um, we just need to know alpha cells for glucagon, beta cells for insulin. Um, Let's take a look. I think I have a diagram that kind of shows the overview and the regulation between, because these are antagonistic, just like PTT calcitonin. Yeah, there we go. All right. So homeostasis, we need to have normal blood glucose levels around 70 to 110 milligrams per deciliter. So that's why people who are diabetic have to test their blood glucose levels because it is insulin that helps to regulate that. But let's see um, what happens when your blood glucose levels rise, say after a meal, which is totally normal. That's what we're expecting to happen. So your body breaks it down, the, all the sugar from your foods absorb into your capillaries, which circulate throughout the whole of your body. So again, this is humoral stimuli. Those um, beta cells monitoring the blood saying, okay, blood sugar is a little bit high, let's do something about it. It releases insulin. Insulin targets all of your body tissues. Um, primarily liver and skeletal muscle, but all of your body tissues are sensitive to insulin. Um, for all cells, it increases glucose coming into the cell. So let's say this is your typical body cell. In that body cell, there is a channel that allows glucose to come in. If insulin is being released and insulin comes in and insulin binds on that receptor channel, then glucose comes into the cell, from the blood into the cell. So when we talk about the effects of insulin, it decreases 
blood glucose levels. And the reason why is because insulin is the key to open the gate to allow glucose to come in from the bloodstream and get into the cells so then the cells can use it uh, or store it, okay? So that's one of the functions, kind of the main body-wide function. It also, the arrival of that insulin helps to increase that glucose usage and ATP generation. So you gotta think back to your cellular respiration, glucose, glycolysis, Krebs, acetyl, um, electron transport chain. So in that is like a stimulator. Insulin helps to stimulate that. In liver and skeletal muscle, the arrival of insulin triggers those organs to store glucose as glycogen. Now remember, glycogen is a storage molecule. It's hundreds and hundreds of glucose is all hooked together. So liver is like our glucose pantry um, and skeletal muscles for their own cells are the glucose pantry. Because if you remember, moderate and peak level of activity, we have to start breaking down that glycogen to burn the glucose to power our myosin heads, okay? Insulin also helps to increase amino acid absorption and protein synthesis. So not only does it allow glucose to come into the cells, but it will also allow, let me get a different color, amino acids to come in. And then lastly, it will increase fat synthesis, my adipose tissue. So we're gonna put more fats into our adipose tissue. All of these things primarily um, the action of storing glucose in your liver, in your skeletal muscle, and allowing glucose to go into your body cells, that's what decreases blood glucose concentrations, bringing us back down to homeostasis, okay? So that's, that happens after a meal, okay? Now, let's say it's been a few hours since you've eaten, and your blood glucose levels are dipping a little bit below or close to that low normal. So again, now we have our alpha cells, beep, 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 beep monitoring our blood, blood glucose is getting low, blood glucose is getting low, what are we going to do? So they release um, glucagon. It doesn't have as many targets because what are we trying to do? We're trying to increase blood glucose levels. So where did we store all that glucose when the times were aplenty, you know, after the fruit loops in the morning? Well, we are going to go to our um, liver and skeletal muscle primarily because that's where we stored it in the time of plenty. Now is the time of famine. So we got to release that stored glucose. So glucagon targets primarily your liver and skeletal muscles to break down all that stored glycogen to produce glucose. All of the fats that got stored in adipose tissue, we can break those down. And because um, fatty acids can be metabolized. Um, and it also triggers the synthesis to, of the liver to actually make new glucose. So there's a process, we're going to talk more about this in the digestive system, but we actually have the ability of liver cells to make brand new glucose, not just break it away from a stored form, actually new glucose. And so now our blood glucose levels rise, homeostasis is restored. So your blood glucose levels does this dynamic equilibrium all throughout the day, right? So after breakfast, after lunch, after dinner, and then you sleep, and then you have breakfast to break your overnight fast, and you have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So we have this increasing of blood glucose, regulating by insulin, decreasing of blood glucose, regulating by glucagon, and then you eat a meal and then we're, you know, um, the increase of blood glucose will be regulated by insulin and so forth and so on. You have that throughout the day. Okay. So what I wanted to talk about, so that's kind of the functioning of those hormones. What I wanted to talk about was diabetes, because it's huge. Um, the population in the United States that have diabetes, unfortunately, is very, very high. So what is diabetes? Well, there's a couple different forms of diabetes. We have adult onset, which is called type 2. And we have juvenile or type 1. Okay. So type 1 also is called um, insulin-dependent diabetes, where usually it's... Um, a developmental or congenital problem with a pancreas just not producing insulin and you are required to have insulin handy to be able to externally regulate your blood glucose levels okay that is not as huge of a problem as type 2 which is the adult onset or insulin independent um, form of diabetes this is usually so this is kind of usually something that you're born with this is more of a lifestyle results so if you have poor eating habits, you have poor exercise habits, those things, and it's genetic, there's some genetic aspect to it too, but you can always improve your diabetic outcome or outlook um, with better lifestyle choices. So 
why it's called adult onset is typically because if you have your poor diet and exercise habits, you, if you eat a lot of sugar or a lot of fat, what happens is your pancreas is continually stimulated to release insulin and your cells are constantly listening to insulin. Well, there's a thing in cell communication called down regulation. So if there's so much of the stimulus, if there's so much of the stimulating molecule, the ligand, less receptors get put up on the surface of the cell. Well, in type two diabetes, that's almost like a semi-permanent change. Your cells become less sensitive to insulin because they're completely bombarded by insulin all the time because you have a high level of sugar in your system regularly. So the problem is you lose the abate, you lose the ability to regulate your blood sugar because of the overwhelming sugar that you've had in your system. But with better lifestyle choices and exercise, those cells can become more sensitive and kind of go back to the healthy homeostasis. So that's why people who are pre-diabetic, if they make those good choices, they may never get to diabetes, that type two diabetes. Um, so that's what I just wanted to clarify type one versus type two and that most people with diabetes that we were dealing with in the United States is our type two, this adult onset, um, which is something that can be addressed and hopefully people can make better choices to reduce their dependence on the drugs that are needed to maintain their blood glucose levels. All right. Um, Okie dokie. So that wraps up the pancreas. Um, the next video will be kind of the miscellaneous potpourri of all of the other um, endocrine organs. I'll talk specifically about the kidney and I think mainly the kidney um, and then some antagonist or relationships and general adaptation syndrome. All right. I'll see you next time. Bye.